So Amazon Prime's Rings of Power has finally dropped the first two episodes after months of drip feeding teasers that gave us very little detail about the bones of the story. In terms of how it's currently being received just days after its release, I don't think anyone can deny there is a clear dichotomy between critics and fans. You just have to look at Rotten Tomatoes. We're unable to look at the Amazon platform itself for reviews because they've suspended them for the first time in its history. According to The Hollywood Reporter, it has suspended reviews for up to 72 hours to quote, help weed out trolls and to ensure each review is legitimate. It will be interesting to see which reviews pass its supposed legitimacy test when we can finally see them. But this comes after reports from Business Insider that claim Amazon will declare Rings of Power a victory regardless of viewing figures. A former senior Amazon Studios exec told the publication, if we can't take this piece of IP and make it successful, why is Amazon Studios even here? It has to succeed. There is no option. What has happened with Amazon Studios handling of this really is a lesson in why you should never alienate the fan base of an IP that is fiercely protective as this, which is what Amazon Studios have managed to repeatedly do. Firstly, despite what showrunners J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay insist, this is a show that clearly has no interest in depicting a true to Tolkien adaptation. I won't go into all the reasons why, but if you're interested, I'll link to a video that sets it all out nicely. But essentially, the main issues can be seen in two major deviations. One of those is that they've taken established events and canon set out in the appendices of The Lord of the Rings, and I believe some parts of The Silmarillion, and messed with the timelines to suit the story they wanted to tell. And the other is that they've taken existing characters and changed them so that they act in a way that is contrary to their established personalities, as well as just blatantly inserted characters in events that they had no part in. Now, I have to stress that while I am a fan of the Lord of the Rings stories, I'm certainly not hardcore and I'm no law expert, but I have read the Silmarillion, so I have a basic understanding of the canon. So when I see Payne and McKay act as though they apparently have no idea why the Lord of the Rings fanbase have reacted the way they have, it makes me wonder if they've even read the material. Either that, or they simply don't care about alienating an entire audience, which to me is just bizarre because these are the people you want to spend money on your product, right? And if not, who is this show for? It's an important question that is repeatedly being asked. I'm honestly confused as to why Amazon would allow such a risk to be taken with such a well-loved IP. It's unclear, but not surprising. Since the blatant butchery we witnessed of the Wheel of Time adaptation last year, it's something we all knew was coming. I know some will say that it's unrealistic to make a straight book-to-screen adaptation, and they'd be right to an extent. Peter Jackson made some changes in his Lord of the Rings trilogy for that very reason, but he did it while remaining true to the ethos he'd set out, and that was that they would not put any of themselves or their ideas or their politics into the films. It was done with reverence to Tolkien and in homage to his work. Considering the scarcity of content Amazon Studios had to work with, they had to fill in a lot of gaps in the story. That's understandable. What I didn't understand, and still don't after having watched the first two episodes, is why they didn't cling to the parts that were set out by Tolkien like gems and construct a story around those instead of bulldozing through it. But anyway, thanks for sticking with me through this introduction. I just wanted to set out some context and thoughts around this. Despite some criticism of how Amazon Studios have handled pretty much everything around this, when it came to the Rings of Power, I wanted to approach the show from a place of openness, allowing myself to view it, while not perhaps as Tolkien as I wanted, but as a high fantasy Tolkien-esque show that could be great in itself. I wanted it to be great for no other reason than the fact that I enjoy watching high fantasy. So, was it billion dollar great? In a word, no. But that doesn't mean it won't get better. I'm going to start with some good and I'll try to stay out of spoiler territory as much as possible. On the visuals, it looks stunning. Some of the costumes and CGI looked a little cheap, which took me out of the illusion, but overall the landscapes and the scenery gave me much of what I wanted from this. 
going down into Khazad Doom was epic to see realised, and these were moments that were paired with fantastic music by Bear McCreary. I've been listening to the score, and I have to say one of my favourite things about the show so far is the music. So much so that I did question whether the music actually does a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to those dramatic moments. I'm not sure they could have stood up without the score as an emotional prompt. The story itself is, I have to say, a little dull so far. We have essentially three arcs occurring. The first is Galadriel searching for proof Sauron is still alive despite everyone trying to convince her he isn't. Arendir, a new elven character, investigates a series of strange occurrences that could mark the return of Sauron, while at the same time setting up a forbidden love story arc with a human woman. And Nuri the Harfoot, after expressing a curiosity for the wider world, which is promptly squashed, discovers what we're led to believe might be a wizard hatched out of a meteor. That's it, after essentially 25% through the first season. Oh, and Elrond goes to see the dwarves about a furnace. If I compare this to the Peter Jackson films, which I can't help but do, two hours in and I'm locked into the story. I don't feel locked into this, not yet. It will all depend on this next episode, I think. On the writing, I had some issues. Firstly, the dialogue was at times so full of exposition and so on the nose that it immediately pulled me out the story. At other times, it was so wrapped in meaningless metaphor that I couldn't help but laugh. Why can't a stone float? This is not billion dollar writing. Episode 1 almost lost me as it lagged in the middle, especially with the introduction of the Harfoots, which killed the mood. But episode 2 was much better and we see some genuinely tense moments with an orc that I was pleased to see was done very well, not CGI orcs. The real problem I have with the writing is that so little time has been set aside to establish character and setting, therefore I'm at a place where I currently don't care about any of the characters and I'm barely invested in their trials. We might have begun with some more scenes showing Galadriel and her brother Finrod, establishing a relationship so that we actually care about whether her brother is dead and why it means so much to her to take up his mission. The Harfoots could have had some opening scenes showing more of their daily life and depicting exactly why it is they hide from humans. Maybe some human children could have found them and started innocently playing with them like dolls, actually hurting the Harfoots. Perhaps more time could have been spent between Arendir and his love interest Bronwyn before she begins to cry when he comes to her doorstep. To be honest, I wasn't really sure what was happening here because they'd only exchanged looks until then. And just on this, I'm seriously at a loss to know why everyone seems to hate elves. Bronwyn's village treat Arendir with utter contempt, acting as though he's their jailer or something for asking how things are going. It's an overreaction that doesn't seem warranted. The same could be said for how a bunch of humans stranded at sea treat Galadriel after finding out she's an elf. Why? Maybe this is something that will be explored in later episodes, but for now it's confusing and feels like conflict for the sake of conflict. Another thing that took me out of the story was that it seems to take people no time at all to get anywhere, giving no sense of distance or depth to Middle Earth. In the stories and the films, there's a sense of journey of the land being so vast and it taking time and effort to reach destinations, rather than saying, let's go to Gaza Doom and, oh, here we are, let's go to see that village to explore that strange occurrence. Oh, here we are, let's sail to Valinor. Oh, there we go. It means we get no exploration of the landscape no depth to the world, and no opportunity to create those small but important moments where characters interact. There's no sense of urgency. On the characters, like I said, I'm caring very little for any of them at this point, and none have evoked reaction in me, other than Galadriel. Galadriel is the centre of all. She who is always right. She who can do no wrong. She who defeats the ogre. She who saves her fellow elves when the whole squadron are almost slaughtered. At this point, I'm thinking, why have any other characters at all? Because they're all superfluous. Their only function is to demonstrate how amazing Galadriel is at everything and how she's always right. It's bad writing, there's no other way to put it. I don't think the actress Morfid Clark brought much to the role, to be honest, but mostly I blame the writing. A character I warmed to more was Norin, and I especially liked her dynamic that she had with her friend Poppy, so I hope this is something that continues to develop. Elrond was pretty forgettable. 
His first scenes with Galadriel were an opportunity to introduce his character, giving us a firm sense of who he is, but instead it seemed like yet again he was simply there to lift Saint Galadriel into the spotlight. I enjoyed his exploration with the dwarves into Casa Doom, and I actually didn't hate the portrayal by the actor Robert Arameo in these scenes but I want the writers to give him more agency of his own. So that's where I'm at with The Rings of Power. Like I said, the worst it could have possibly been for me was Wheel of Time Bad. It wasn't Wheel of Time Bad, but it certainly has a way to go before I can call it good. For now, I'll continue to watch to see where it goes. Thanks so much for watching, and let me know your own thoughts on the show in the comments. Until next time, guys, happy reading.